Okay, good evening. And God is good, amen. amen. So we're going to look into the book of Luke, chapter 1. We're in the second half, half of Luke. If you're joining us on Facebook, we say welcome to you. You may be watching this archived, and uh, we say welcome to you. And uh, if you have any questions on Facebook as we're discussing or you hear discussions or thoughts come to you, you can ask the questions. We have someone that's actually monitoring, and if they see your question pop up, and uh, then they'll ask the question for you, and uh, don't, don't have to say your name if you don't want your name mentioned, and they'll ask the question for you. And uh, I think if you watch this, if it's recorded and not live, I think you can still ask the questions, and it'll flag me that the question's been asked, and I can answer it in another week or at another time. So... Anyway, we're in the book of Luke, chapter 1. This is the second lesson of chapter 1. We introduced Luke last week and got started. Gabriel went and to the temple, met Zechariah, said, you're going to have a child. <coughs> Zechariah was struck dumb. Why was he struck dumb? Because he didn't believe. So he could not speak. When he went out to the people, he couldn't speak, and they thought something miraculous has happened here. And uh, so then the angel Gabriel went to Mary and shows up with Mary, and we looked at that, that in the sixth month, uh, or, or we'll pick that up tonight, that, uh, that he goes to see Mary. So that's in verse 26, and uh, here's what it says. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And so, and now it begins. It has gone from Zechariah, and I talked to you before and said that, that one of the significant things to understand is there is a transfer being made of ministries. And that transfer of ministries is going to be uh, coincidental, it's going to coincide together for a season, and that's the, the ministry of the priesthood of John the Baptist, who's coming out of the tribe of Moses, of the lineage of Aaron. He's the son of a priest. And so John the Baptist is actually fulfilling the priesthood of Aaron. He's the last in the line of the priesthood of Aaron as far as the covenants are concerned. So his his ministry is going to come along a side of this other ministry. This other ministry is going to be the ministry of Jesus Christ, who is going to be the initiator of a new covenant that God had prophesied in the Old Testament. Behold, in those days I will make with them a new covenant. And also God had prophesied that this priest would not be after the lineage of Aaron, but actually be after the order of Melchizedek. He's not going to be the lineage of Aaron. So John the Baptist is going to be the last of the lineage of Aaron as far as that covenant is concerned. And Jesus, of course, is going to come and initiate a new covenant and start a new priesthood uh, and will become our high priest. This is shown to us in the book of Luke because Luke is uh, concentrating on this particular aspect. We don't get that same aspect in Matthew or Mark or John for different reasons. So that that's... So now we're going to get more information about the birth of Jesus in Luke. And so, we, so Gabriel shows up to Mary. And uh, so you see in your notes, here's, here's a few things about it. Her name was Mary. That's the, the name Miriam. Uh, you would remember that's Moses and Aaron's sister, Miriam, that took a tam tambourine and danced. And um, same name. Daughter of the royal family, lineally descended from David. And when we get to that chapter, we're going to look at the lineage of Mary. Matthew chapter 1 is the lineage of Joseph. We're going to look at the lineage of Mary, and both of them are of the lineage of David. But there's something very significant about Mary's lineage that differs from Joseph's lineage, and it, it is actually a prophecy fulfillment. When we get to that chapter, we'll look at that, and you'll see there is a difference in that lineage and then we'll see a purpose in the difference of that lineage, uh, and it fulf also fulfills Scripture. Uh, a virgin, a pure, unspotted one, and uh, we we and we believe that uh, that it is absolutely vital that she was a virgin. That that, that is vital. To, could not just be any average teenage girl or young lady. She had to be a virgin. She could not have been with a man. Jesus had to be born of the seed of a woman, according to Scripture. 
She lived in Nazareth, which is a city in Galilee. I put the map in front of you. I don't know if you can read it. It's small. But Galilee is up there. That section, you'll see the Sea of Galilee at the top of the map. And to the left of that, you'll see uh, the, a region called Galilee. That's the northern kingdom, the, what, the northern part of the kingdom. And below the word Galilee, you'll see the word Nazareth. So you'll see where uh, that city is in comparison. They spoke a different dialect in, in Galilee than they would in Nazareth. You'll know that when Peter uh, is, is uh, denying the Lord, one of the things that they knew about Peter is that he was from the north and that he was with Jesus. He had the same dialect. And, uh, he, you know, we kind of joke about it. We're in North Carolina. And so I say it jokingly. One of the things that caused the Judean southern kingdom, the Pharisees and the people from Bethlehem and Jerusalem to reject Jesus as the Messiah. They didn't realize he was born in the south, that he was a Yankee as far as they were concerned. He had a northern accent. He was a Galilean. And with a northern accent, they, they would say there's no way um, a Yankee is going to be the Messiah. This is my terminology. Amen. Apologies to any Yankees out there that may be offended. Uh, but if you live in the south, the southerners know what I mean. <laughs> so, <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, she lives in, in Nazareth. Uh, the, the, uh, historians tell us or scholars tell us that it had uh, uh, a bad reputation uh, as a town. It had no reputation for, for religion or for learning. Um, bordered upon the heathen, therefore was called Galilee of the Gentiles. Remember the southern death of the southern side, uh, the towns are where Jesus is going to interact toward the end of his ministry. Uh, there, they are in, a, in an enclave of uh, strict Jewishness, for lack of a better term. Whereas Galilee is much more mixed. There's travel route, routes uh, that's going to bring Gentiles into the area, and they're going to have much more of a cosmopolitan background to the north. And so uh, Nazareth, being a northern city, uh, would also have that reputation. Galilean, um, Gentile, and so Nathaniel, when he said that, when uh, his brother says to him, we've met Jesus of Nazareth, he says, uh, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Um, and the point is, you know, take any particular city, we call Las Vegas Sin City, and if we were to say, hey, you need to hear this preacher, he's out of Las Vegas, we'd say, are there any preachers in Las Vegas? So, uh, my apologies to Las Vegas and all the preachers out there. So, uh, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this particular part because during the Christmas season we cover that. Uh, and, but there, just to, to kind of go over very quickly, here's what the angel says, that she's highly favored. The angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb, bring forth a son, and, uh, and uh, call his name Jesus. So she's highly favored. The Lord is with her. She's blessed among women. She's going to conceive in her womb, bring forth a son, and she was born, and she was to name him Jesus. The word Jesus, you may hear people uh, call him Yeshua. That is the same word as Joshua of the Old Testament. So the book Joshua is the book Yeshua. It is the book Jesus, and so uh, it is the exact same word. Mm -hmm. And so his name would have been a very common name when they say you call his name Jesus. Uh, that would have been a very common name. There would have been a lot of Joshua's running around or Yeshua's running around. So this Yeshua the Christ um, or Jesus the Christ is why you see him um, referred to with title in that sense because they're delineating, delineating him from all the other Joshua's running around. Are you talking about God the Son of or Joshua the Christ, Je Yeshua the Christ or Jesus the Christ, which is which is Christ is not his name, obviously, is his title. Like we call John the Baptist, it's Jesus the Christ. And, uh, and so you call his name Yeshua, which means Savior, uh, and, and he will save his people from their sins. Now, I just want to talk to you about Mary for a minute, and there's always questions about Mary. When I, I was not raised in church, 
as, as you know, and, and I was raised completely secular. I did not know anything about religion at all. I didn't understand denominations. I didn't know there was a difference between Protestant and Catholic, Catholics. I knew as a kid in England that the Protestants and Catholics were fighting uh, in Northern Ireland, and every now and then to be a car bomb and those kinds of things, and I, I didn't understand it. I always understood it to be more political than religious, so I, I, did, I knew nothing about it. So when I came to Christ, my introduction was basically reading the Word of God. I, I, my theology was basically formed around reading the Word of God. Uh, I was taught that uh, if you want to know God, read the Bible. So I didn't have religious background, I didn't have religious training, and I didn't understand anything about Mary. In the Bible, when you read about Mary, we don't see um, the kinds of things that, that is found in the Catholic religion. We don't see anybody praying to her. We don't see uh, that kind of reverence toward her. She's honored, but we don't see that kind of reverence. So uh, one day, a, a lady who was a Catholic friend, a neighbor, and I were talking. I was newly saved and zealous and everything, and I knew she went to church. She went to, to Mass on Sundays, and we were talking, uh, and she'd said something about the Blessed Virgin, and I, not knowing, said, um, said something about Mary. I said, well, Mary spoke in tongues. And when I said that, the look on her face, I mean, she went white, because the Bible says Mary was in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. It very clearly says she was there, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke with tongues as Spirit. So for me, having read that, it wasn't a big deal. It was a shock. It wasn't, I had, you know, I just said it. And when I said it, I said, well, Mary spoke in tongues. I just said it as a statement. I wasn't trying to start a fight. I wasn't trying to hurt the lady, anything. But man, did I wound her. Um, and so I, that was my first inclination that not everybody saw this thing the same way I understood this thing. So I wanted to put in here just a couple of things about the Catholic view of Mary. Um, and I took this particular writing from the website catholic.org, and I put the website there the, uh, so that you could, could see it. And here's the quote out of the, off that website. Uh, looking first at scripture, the principal basis for the doctrine of Mary as spiritual mother of all humanity is found in the Gospel of John. In this scene, Mary is at Calvary at the foot of the cross with John, the beloved disciple. John tells us when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. That's out of John 19, 26 and 27. Throughout the church's history, numerous popes, theologians, and writers have confirmed their belief that here John is symbolic of all humanity. In other words, that Jesus from the cross gave his mother to every human person for all time. Now, if we say that Mary gave birth to Jesus, the head of the body, then it must be that she gave birth to the entire body, since a true body cannot be separated. Thus, it would mean that she gave birth to the members as well. In giving physical birth to Jesus, we can say that Mary made it possible for us to receive spiritual life through him. We were dead, and through him we have come back to life, and it was Mary's yes at the Annunciation that made our rebirth possible. So we would say to a certain extent, yes, we have the opportunity for salvation because of Mary. We would not say that John is symbolic of all humanity. We would say that when Jesus said, Behold your son, behold your mother, that it was literal and not figurative and not symbolic. And so that was, would be one place where the Protestants would differ from the Catholics. Uh, I bring to you uh, a, another quote. Now this is out of an article by John MacArthur. And uh, again, I put the website there uh, uh, for you to look at. And, and this is, um, it, well, it says this. Um, in his paper in 1854, Pope Pius IX established his dogma, the Immaculate Conception of Mary, which preserved her from inheriting original sin. His concluding statements provide a good summary of, summary of the Catholic view of Mary. Let all the children of the Catholic Church, so quote, here's the, here's the paper. Let all the children of the Catholic Church, who are so very dear to us, hear these words of ours. With a still more ardent zeal for piety, religion, and love, let them continue to venerate, invoke, 
and pray to the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, conceived without original sin. Let them fly with utter confidence to this most sweet Mother of mercy and grace in all dangers, difficulties, needs, doubts, and fears. Under her guidance, under her patronage, under her kindness and protection, nothing is to be feared, nothing is hopeless. Because while bearing toward us a true motherly affection and having in her care the work of our salvation, she is solicitous about the whole human race. And since she has been appointed by God to be the queen of heaven and earth and is exalted above all the choirs of angels and saints and even stands at the right hand of her only begotten son, Jesus Christ our Lord, she presents our petitions in a most efficacious manner. What she asks, she obtains. Her pleas can never be unheard. Now, this is written by the Pope in 1854. So that's the Catholic view of Mary. So when you get into discussions, um, the thing is, again, we're in the South and don't run into a lot of Catholics in our, in our um, circles, in, in our community. So here's the Protestant view. And as Protestants, this is, this is how we view it. Uh, first of all, Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9. Uh, when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book. Worship God. So our first answer is we worship God only. Uh, and we worship God only. We don't worship any humans. Uh, when you read your Bible, uh, what you will find is uh, Mary doesn't play any role in the biblical explanation of the gospel, in the, in the explanation of salvation. She's not mentioned. She is mentioned, obviously, in giving birth to Christ. But she is not mentioned in any aspect of the gospel in any other way. Uh, Paul wrote a magnificent treatise on the doctrine of salvation that we know is the book of Romans. And all he said about the mother of Jesus is that she was, quote, a descendant of David, Romans 1.3. So if he's going to write about salvation, and if these things were true about Mary, this is where and when he could have said it. So we reject the thinking that, um, that she is uh, without original sin. We reject the thinking that we pray to her, that she's to be venerated or any of those things. Uh, again, I believe we should be respectful of our Catholic friends. I believe we should be respectful. Um, but we should understand that, there is a, that Mary was honored by God. But she was a sinner like the rest of us. And as a sinner who gave birth to the Son of God, she's not immaculate. She, she, she's not without original sin. And the Bible goes on to tell us that not only is she that and that, but she's not even a virgin. She had more children. And you can read in Matthew 13 the names of Jesus' brothers and sisters. And, and it lists them there. So um, we don't want to offend and we're not trying to. Not, but we just need to, know, need to know where we stand on that. Yes, sir. When I've talked to Catholics in the past, everything you just listed here, you know, they pray to her, you know, immaculate conception. I, I pointed out that that's not in the New Testament. Correct. Catholic teaching. And what many Catholics have done, they've taken the church's teaching of what the Pope says, and they've merged it with the New Testament, and it's all one to them. Correct. And I mean, you try to point it out to them, they've been indoctrinated so much, they actually believe it. Because I've tried to tell them that Immaculate conception is there's an exclusive club of people that were born sinless. Adam and Eve, they were born sinless, but they fell. They became sinful, but they were born sinless along with Jesus, and that's it. Right. They're, they're, you can't, nobody else can join that exclusive club, but the Pope did this on his own. And, and what we do have to understand the, the cry of the Protestant Church was sola scriptura. Solo, sola Scriptura meant only the Word. So we turn back to only the, only the Word. So in the Protestant church, we teach, it's taught, we're taught, when you're born again, whether you come into, whether you're born in the church, or you're, you know, your parents are Christians, and when you're dedicated as a baby, and then you grow up in Sunday school, you're taught, read the Bible for yourself. Read the Bible for yourself. If you come in at a later time as a teenager or a young adult or a mid in midlife, when you come into the church, you get saved, born again, what the scripture says. We will teach you, as I was taught, read the word of God. You want to know about God? Read the word of God. 
the, the ministers, pastors and deacons and elders, their responsibility is to encourage you and to walk alongside of you. But ultimately, it is you are to know God personally and you are to know his word personally. Read the word of God. And so the, the concept in some is the church being the mother uh, born of the Virgin Mary. Then the church explains how God is and what God does. Those who have been raised in that tradition or those who are taught that then do look to the teaching of the church. And so rather than going to the word themselves, they take what the church says to them. And we would say, listen, we're not trying to start a fight about Mary. We don't want to, we don't um, want to, to just beat you over the head. But here's all we'll say to you. Read the word of God. Just go back and read what the Bible says for yourself. There was a time that we understand that the word of God was not available to the common man. And so the only way you could know what the word of God said was by the ministers. And they would read the word or they would tell you what the word said. And so villages, hamlets, towns, cultures were built around whatever the, pre whatever the preachers were telling them. Because they, they didn't have the word of God in their own language. And they didn't have the word of God in their own homes. So... Uh, but through the years, God comes, God works it out so that we have a printing press. The Bible's written in our own language. Many men died in order to bring it to us in our own language. And now we have it for ourselves. So all we say to you is if you have questions about these things, before even you turn to preachers or anything else, go back and read the Word of God. So even now, as I'm looking into the Word of God, as we look at it, we study the Word of God, but, but we do it while you've got your Bibles open. So that we look at it together. So that if I say something and you can say, but wait a minute, it says this. How, why are you telling me that? And we can have a discussion about it, which of course um, can be dangerous because some of you are hard-headed and cantankerous and then it turns into a nice big fight. But, you know, but then, you know, hallelujah, we have fun with it. So, but, but it's, it, the, the principle is this, know the word of God, read the word of God. And, and the, what the Bible says about Mary is it honors her. It gives her her honor. She's blessed among women. She's highly favored. She should be given that respect and that esteem. She has been chosen by God to bring Jesus into the earth. But as far as the plan of salvation is concerned, as far as man and his covenant with God is concerned, Mary is not a part of it in that aspect. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a friend that's my age, and uh, she was brought up Catholic in, in New York. And uh, when I got saved, I tried to witness to her and, and talk to her about the Bible. And she said, well, we never read the Bible. Right. We, we didn't have a Bible. We weren't taught to read the Bible. So they don't know right. the Bible. Her, I can say that as growing up as a Catholic. I didn't know what a personal relationship with Jesus was. I mean, right. it was more, for me, of course, looking back, you know, it was, it was more of a ritual thing. You, know, you, you went, you sat, you stood, you kneeled, but the priest did everything. We just, right. and even in the home, we didn't read the Bible. And, and you know, so I knew, I mean, I knew and I believed that Jesus died on the cross. I believe he was born of the birth, you know, I believe that, and I believe he died on the cross, but I didn't know personally right. what it meant to actually have a personal relationship with Jesus until I was an adult and and when I first actually joined Hazelwood Baptist Church and I was like okay y'all this is new to me I don't know what this right. you know because I had never right. read the Bible and so I can say for, but I did have these questions about I thought right. Mary was a nice person but right. not to be so of course, if you said that to my mother in those days, it that would have been... got my head knocked off. And, <laughs> exactly. And uh, and I would say, well, why do we, not as a kid, but older, I said, why do I confess to a priest? Well, it's more why do I go to God? I, I, I didn't sin against that priest, but it was God. Right. You know, like a, mm. right. And I was sort of a little bit of a rebellious, not a little bit, but, so yeah, I can, I can say that, you know, uh, I mean, I, but I didn't know. I had no clue what a personal relationship was. Right. And that the, the thing is, we can only live what, what we're taught until we get older and start investigating. 
And many that raised in Protestant, kids raised in Protestant churches get out there and, you know, 16, 17 years old, and they're like, I got to find this out for myself. And uh, all we can do is go back and say, the only thing we can tell you is read the Word. If you read the Word, we believe that it's inspired of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, it is said, and you've heard it said, that the Bible is the only book in the world that when you read it, the author is there with you. So go back to the Word, and Amen. He's with you, and so He'll open your eyes. Yeah, the graven images and all the statues and the ritualistic part of that, you know, does not lead to a personal relationship with the Lord. Correct, and, and that's, the, that's the issue. What we're talking about tonight with, with Mary is the, is the differing views, and the Protestant view, we give her honor, we give her respect, but we don't pray to her, we don't believe she was, con that, you know, uh, immaculate conception or any of those things. So, um, just to point those two differences out, okay? You know, that, okay. Um, Go ahead. I have friends that are um, Mexicans, and uh, they are very, you know, into Roman, Roman Catholic beliefs and right. stuff, and they used to react very strangely to me because, you know, I just loved them and prayed for them and would even not go there. Yeah. And um, it's taken years but um they they're really friendly with me now and and i'm still praying for them because i believe that they will come to get the right. brothers off and come to know the lord but it's, it's sad because the whole families are all all into all of it and it's, right. it's just sad because they're most people that are just deceived and, right but i just figure the love of jesus and the prayer will break through so i'm not quitting and we're just going to keep loving and keep trying to be an influence you know for every different type of person. There are Catholics persons. that stay. Of course. And, and they stay in the Catholic Church. Sure. And I know, yeah. I know stay spirit-filled Catholics. Right. And w after I had that encounter, um, my French teacher, who was a Catholic charismatic, was one of my first encounters with a char Catholic charismatic. And she she was on she I had graduated high school, went to a Bible study, sitting in a circle, and I looked across... And we were introducing each other. I wasn't really paying attention. And the lady says, I know you, that young man. He was my student. So I looked up at her, and I forget her name, but, but um, oh, Mrs. West, whatever her name was, and, you know. And so, so yes, and she was, was Catholic. And I would say this about, she was influenced. There, we had a French club, Bible club at her house, and she had crosses everywhere as a, as a Catholic. And we had gone into one of her rooms to do a seance. And um, I don't know, there was five or six of us high schoolers. We were going to have a seance. They just said, hey, we're going to have a seance. Like, all right, what, whatever. So we got into the room, and the girl who was going to conduct the seance says, oh, we can't do it with the crosses in the room. <laughs> and so I said, I'm out. <laughs> I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't, but it wasn't religion. It was disrespect for the lady. You can't take stuff. Don't take the lady's knickknacks off the walls. I mean, that's just disrespectful. So it wasn't like I had a religious view toward it as much as it was just, you know, don't go moving the stu lady stuff off the wall. So I, I bowed out. I looked back and see how the Holy Spirit was working in my life, even at that time, protecting me from things and everything else. So now, here's where it starts. To sure. Sure it is. Uh, my mother-in-law was, was the same. I mean, she was an Italian lady, born and raised Catholic, but she had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So that's what I usually look look at when I hear people say, "Because I've heard a lot of Protestants say, oh, Catholic can't get saved." That's not true. Well, no, yeah. that's not true. And there's some Protestants that are Christians. We we also have to uh, have to understand that a lot of people sitting in our churches don't know what they believe. That's true. So so people, you know, we talk about this as their doctrine, but that doesn't mean everybody who's sitting in a Catholic church believes it, because not everybody even knows it. Correct. So so just like I could sit here and talk to you about Arminianism versus Calvinism and say we're Arminianism. Well, our, we're Arminians, and, and half the congregation look at me blankly and say, yes, pastor, having no idea, what are we? I have no idea, but, you know, what's that mean? I don't know. 
Well, all, all I want to know is, am I going to put food, is this put, does that help me put food on the table or not? The, you know, does it help me deal with my unruly teenagers? I don't, you know, so, so while we talk about, the only reason I brought it up is not to start some kind of thing, is just it, when we're doing a study and we're looking at things, we, get, we say, okay, here's a view, we disagree with this view, this is our view. And, and this is why we have this view. These are the scriptures that we have. Um, and this is why we have this view. So it, that's the purpose of it. And I know, I knew when I did it that it would, could be a hotbed, but hot button. But the whole idea is we're in a Bible study. Let's, you know, the Bible doesn't shy away from these things. So let's let's look at it. All right. But now it starts getting fun because this is where where I start getting excited about this next part. The, the, all of it's exciting. But after after the angel Gabriel shows up. And, and tells Mary that she's going to have a baby. The Bible goes on to say then, in verse 39, after, after he said to her, you're going to have a baby and everything, and she says, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to your word, and, and, and all that. Then verse 39 says, Now Mary arose in those days, went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah. Scholars think it's the city of Hebron, doesn't say, so it doesn't, so it doesn't matter in that sense. Entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. Now we already have met Zacharias from the from the early part of the chapter. This is the priest who is in the temple, and so she goes to Zacharias and Elizabeth's house. And here's where it gets fun because in verse 41 it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is the first time we get this terminology that anyone is filled with the Holy Spirit in this sense, and this and it's a woman who gets filled with the Holy Spirit. And it is Elizabeth when she gets filled with the Holy Spirit. So, and so we look at it. And so verse 42, uh, the babe leaped in her womb. Then verse 42, she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Now I put in your notes, God's secret. Psalm 25 verse 14, The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show them his covenant. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. You see, Mary had a secret. She was with child. She probably wasn't ready to tell a whole lot of people that she was with child not being married. And so it's not something she's, she is not showing and she's not telling. So she walks in the room and God says, I know a secret and I'm telling Elizabeth. And Elizabeth says it out loud. So it's no longer a secret. Because Mary, because Elizabeth, Elizabeth said, "Blessed are you among women." Well, that'd be fine. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. It's like, oh, you just let the cat out of the bag, Elizabeth. Now, this what, this is funny to me because years ago, over twenty years ago, um, a young lady in our church uh, got pregnant out of wedlock, and the parents called me. It was a Saturday evening, and they called me. The family's devastated. There's tears. The girl's crying, mama's crying, daddy's crying, aunts come over, cousins come over, house is filled. These are all good um, country folk, just a, just a good Appalachian family, and, and they're all devastated. You know, the girl is pregnant. Now, you know, I'm there, I'm praying with the family and, and trying to comfort and doing all those things. So that's Saturday night. Sunday morning, we get to church, and during service, people came forward for prayer. And I was praying for people on the left side of the, the altar and people are, and to the right side there was another lady praying and this teenage girl came down to the front with a few other ladies and they were all gathered around. They were somber. Nobody knew. They just found out she was pregnant. Nobody knew. And I knew. Obviously I had been called but I told not a soul. So the lady that was over to my right praying when the girl walked up she starts to pray for her. She stopped. She put her hand down on her belly and said with a loud voice, there's life in this womb. And I'm standing on the other side of the... And I go, well, it's not a secret anymore. <laughs> but then she began to prophesy. And this is where it became significant. She began to prophesy. Thus saith the Lord, this baby will come to full term. This baby will be of full health. And I will bless this child. She began to speak over that young lady, uh, blessing over that baby what no one knew and even I didn't know that at that moment the dad of the young girl 
had a doctrinal belief that he, he was like a, a patriarch, and so he had told the whole family, God will kill that kid. God will kill it. God will kill it. it cut, you know, and his doctrine was that to dishonor his name, so his name wouldn't be dishonored, God was going to kill the baby. So isn't it interesting that the Lord had to speak a word over that girl that the baby will come to full term and it will be born healthy and that it had to be done in such a supernatural way so that it wasn't just encouraging words, it was a prophetic word because the girl, the lady didn't even know she was pregnant yet. I met this young man a couple of years ago. I went back to that area for a funeral and the mother, the, who, the teenage girl who now is 20 plus years past that comes up to me, oh, Brother Paul, and hugging and everything. She says, meet my son. And, uh, and, and we shake hands and hug. And I say, yeah, this is awesome. And uh, so I, think, I can't read this passage that I don't think of that event because Elizabeth lets the cat out of the bag. And she does it with a loud voice. You're pregnant! <laughs> blessed is the mother, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And then she not only knows that she's pregnant, but look what else she knows, verse 43. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So Elizabeth, being filled with the Holy Spirit, is getting revelation. And the revelation is, it's a child. The revelation is, it's God's child. The revelation is, this is the Messiah. This woman who's prophesying is no, is no novice. This is a woman who's raised a daughter of Aaron. She's of the lineage of Aaron. She's married to a priest. She knows the word. She knows what the Messiah is about. She's been around. So when she starts speaking these things, this is not just somebody coming off, off, bouncing off the wall. This is a woman who's filled, God says of her in the first chapter that she was righteous and just before God. And so this is a godly woman filled with the Holy Spirit who's starting to prophesy. Um, verse 45, blessed is she who believed for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. And so this is an exciting time. So now Mary is beginning to prophesy, beginning to sing. And she sings what we call the Magnificat. The Magnificat is, we get the term from the Latin. Remember that much of the church uh, was taught Latin. Uh, and the Latin Vulgate was the principal Bible for many, uh, for many years. And so... Um, I put in there the Latin words, but the translated, my soul magnifies the Lord. In verse 46, the first thing Mary says is, my soul magnifies the Lord. And then she goes on to say, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. Mary needed a Savior like the rest of us. Mary needed a Savior like the rest of us. God, my soul and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. So she begins to sing this beautiful prophecy for, and, and begins to say, He's regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. Behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed, even as this generation does. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. And when it uses that term, fear him, it is that term respect or, or reverence. It is the same kind of respect or reverence that you would give to a very powerful judge, to a very pow person of great power. If someone of great authority walked in the room, you'd give him respect. As a matter of fact, you would give respect to when you get blue lighted and that officer walks up to your window. You give him great fear. You give him reverence. You give him, he says, may I see your license and your insurance? And you say, yes, sir. Is there anything I did wrong, officer? And you are respectful. Well, how much more then would, would God say, if you will be that way toward a police officer, how much more should you be toward me since a police officer can give you a ticket and I will stand and judge your soul for all of eternity? Those who fear or reverence my name, then he goes on to say, I've got mercy for you. My mercy is to every generation. He's shown strength with his arm. He's scattered the proud, the imagination of their hearts. He's put down the mighty from their thrones, exalted the lowly, filled the hungry with good things. The rich he sent empty away. He's helped his servant Israel. He remembers in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her house. I've always had a question 
personally because Mary, it says that in the verse 26 that it was the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy and Mary stayed there three months. So did Mary stay for the birth of the baby? It doesn't tell us that. It just said she stayed three months. So I, it doesn't tell us, but I always assume, why would, you, why would you stay three months unless you were staying for the birth of the baby? I have no idea. So just, just one of those things. But we do know she stayed for, the, for three months and returned to her house. Now Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered. She brought forth her son. And here goes the next part. When her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown mercy to her, they rejoiced. And so on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. Why on the eighth day? That's the law. It's required by law. They, these yes. people are under the law. Jesus is also going to be circumcised according to law because he's born under the law and he fulfills the law. So the law is that the male child should be circumcised the eighth day. So they're in accordance with the law. And they would have called his name Zacharias, but his mother said, no, he should be called John. But they said to her, there's no one among your relatives who's called by this name. So they made signs to his father. Now some speculate they, had, they made signs to his father, which means that he may have not also been able to hear. He's not only mute, but he also may have been deaf. Because they had to sign to him, what do you want your son? They didn't just ask him. Uh, be that as it may, they made signs to him, what do you want your son called? And he asked for a writing tablet and said his name is John, um, jo Joannes or, or jo Jokanon. There's many of this name in the Old Testament, so this is also a very common name. We know John uh, that wrote the book of Revelation and wrote the gospel and wrote the epistles. His name is John. There's going to be a lot of Johns, just like there's a lot of Yeshua's or Jesus in the day. There's also a lot of Johns. And so that's one of the reasons he's named John Baptist or John the Baptist to delineate him. His name would have been John Bar Zacharias. Bar meaning son of and Zachariah, son of Zachariah. So we do that today. We have people whose names are David Johnson, David, son of John. And the way they delineated last names, it was, you know, um, James and John, sons of Zebedee. And so how do you know which James and Johns was Zebedee's kids? And so, um, so his name would have been, they would have called him Bar Zacharias, but they, when he started doing his ministry, they didn't call him. They called him John Baptist or John the Baptist. Uh, how do you know? Just like some people call me Preacher Paul. Uh, why? It's what, what you do. You preach. So it delineates from all, from the other Pauls that you might know. In 113, it said the angel was told Zacharias. And that you shall name his name John. So why'd they name him John? Because the angel told him, name him John. So they're going to name him John according to, according to what the angel told him. The word means Jehovah is gracious. That's what it means. And it, it, it means that John is going to be forerunner of the outpouring of the grace of God. And so here comes the final aspect, the final part. Zechariah, the final part of this chapter. Zacharias now... Verse 67 gets in on it. Now Zacharias filled with the Holy Spirit. Boy, things are fun around the, the Zacharias and Elizabeth household, aren't they? Things, things are, go, are popping around their household. They've been serving God. They love God. They're pre, he's a priest. They're righteous. They love God. She's barren. But they're continuing on faithful, faithful. Zacharias gets a vision of an angel. Now Elizabeth is pregnant. Joy, joy, joy all around the house. And uh, Elizabeth's six months pregnant, and she goes to the door. Mary's there, opens the door. She gets filled with the, with the Spirit of God, starts to prophesy. Woohoo! Glory to God! Things are just popping. And now, three months later, they, they're, John's born. Everybody's happy. Name him John. Zachariah's mouth is open. It's like, man, this is awesome. I'm talking again. This is great. Things are going good. But not only is he talking, boom, he gets filled with the Holy Spirit. Now he starts to prophesy. Things are popping. There's a revival around the household of Zacharias and Elizabeth. And Elizabeth's just going, Amen, brother. Amen, brother. I could just see her in the background. Amen. Preach, bro. Preach. Go ahead. Preach, brother. Uh, so, <laughs> and so Zacharias, filled with the Holy Spirit, <coughs> prophesied, said, Now this is called the Benedictus. And if you ever heard, the, heard this term, and then it comes from the Latin of the first words of this, um, 
and, and, and I put the Latin there for you. I'm not going to try to pronounce, but blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. So that, that's why it gets the term Benedictus, if you ever hear that term. So he begins to sing. He begins to sing of a saving or prophesy of a saving purpose. Verse 68, he's visited and provide redemption for his people. So the first thing he's done is re provided redemption. And let me just tell you something about redemption very quickly. I put it in your notes. There's three primary terms for the term redemption. And it is a term that Israel would and the, the Jewish people would have been very familiar with, the term of redemption. The verb in the Hebrew, para is a legal term concerning the substitution required for the person or animal delivered. Also used in relation to legislation with regard to the firstborn. Every firstborn male, whether human or animal, belonged to Yahweh and hence was to be offered to Yahweh. Firstborn males of ritually clean animals were sacrificed while firstborn unclean animals were redeemed. Human firstborn were redeemed, either by the substitution of animal or by the payment of a fixed sum, Numbers 18, 16. What's it mean? The firstborn child was to be, was just like your tithes, the firstborn is, belongs to the Lord. The first one belongs to the Lord. And many households, especially in the Catholic household, the firstborn was to be the priest. Right? My son's going to be a priest. Why? Because he's firstborn. The firstborn belongs to the Lord. And so I saw a statistic, whether, whether, uh, but I but think I remember it saying something crazy like 80% of men in the ministry are first, firstborn. And uh, it, it would make, uh, make sense if God said the firstborn belonged to me. I happen to be firstborn. So the Lord basically said, you mine. You firstborn, you belong to me. Now what they would do is they'd go back and they would go to the temple and they would make an offering and redeem or buy him back. Now when they buy the child back, what they're saying is it's our responsibility to take care of the Lord's property. It's the Lord's property, but I've redeemed it. And so now this is my this is this is uh, God's property that I've redeemed. I've bought back. So that's the first term, term of redemption. The second one is the gaol or guile, gall, the legal term for the deliverance of person, property, or right to which one had a previous claim through family relation or possession. The goel or is the term for the person who performed the duties of the redeemer. Terms found 18 times in the Old Testament. So the duty of a man's redeemer, usually his next of kin, to buy back the freedom that he had lost, for example, through debt. Uh, an example is found in Leviticus 25. This is what happened with Ruth and Boaz. That Ruth had, had remember Naomi's husband died. They were, excuse me, they were in debt. And so Ni Ruth goes to Boaz and Boaz says, I want to buy back your debt. I want to purchase your debt. That means I would then not only get the land that belonged to Ahimelech, the father, and the sons, but I also get their property or their responsibilities. You don't like the term property? I fully understand. It's the responsibility. And part of the responsibility is Naomi and Ruth. And so Boaz, when Ruth says, you'll be my redeemer, Boaz says, well, there's one next of kin who's clo closer, and he has the first right of refusal. So he can redeem or buy back or pay the debt and he will get the land. He will be responsible then to take care of you. So he meets with the guy at the gate. Remember in the book of Ruth, says to the guy, um, Ahimelech's passed away. His property is up, for, is up for foreclosure in a sense. Do you want to redeem it? Do you want to get it out of hawk, out of debt? And the guy says, yeah, I'll do that. And so Boaz says, okay, well, when you do, you also got to take care. You've got to get uh, Naomi, but you also have a Moabitess, Ruth. Moabitess being a Gentile. The guy says, I don't want to pollute my bloodline with a Moabitess. I don't want it. Boaz says, well, if you don't want it, I'm going to take it. The guy says, I don't want it. You take it, which is how Boaz ended up redeeming or buying back Ruth, marries her, and the rest is history. She gives birth to a child who gives birth to a man, to a child named Obed, or to, to a, who gives birth to a child named David. Ruth then becomes part of the lineage, and her revelation of God is that he is a kinsman redeemer. So when Zacharias is, is saying in this revelation that he has visited his people, visited and redeemed his people. So now the redemption that what we talk about as Christians is we were, we did belong to God. We were free moral agents. 
but we sold ourselves to sin. And sin became our taskmaster and our slave master. And sin owned us. And we became slaves of sin. And as slaves of sin, we were powerless to get out from under the bondage of sin. So Jesus, par, Jesus' job then, in this aspect of redemption, was to come and pay the price to pay back for us to bring us out from under the slavery to sin. The problem is, what is the wage of sin? The wage of sin is death. So how are you going to redeem the people? You have to pay a price. What's the price? He has to die. So when Jesus died, he was literally paying a redemption price for us. So that when he went to the Father and presented the blood of the, off of the offering to the Father, he goes to the Father and says, Father, I have the price for their redemption. It is blood. Blood representing death. That is why when we take communion together, he says this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the remission of sins. It means you're released from sin. You're released from the penalty of sin and the power of sin. You are redeemed. And so we forever now owe our life to our Redeemer, who has bought our liberty through the blood that he shed on Calvary. So when uh, Zacharias, filled with the Holy Spirit, says, visited and redeemed his people, he's saying a mouthful. And we sing, I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Filled with the Holy Ghost I am. All my sins are washed away. I've been redeemed. The third term... Jewish or Hebrew term is the term kapar. It means to cover. To cover sin, atone, or make expiation or associated meanings. The substance koper or kapar is of interest in that it signifies a price paid for a life that has become forfeit. So not only did Jesus buy us free, but he also paid the price to become our covering. So that just like we, when we go to court, stand before the judge and the judge says, do you have an attorney? We say, yes. yes, and he will do all the talking for me. And so when we stand before God, we stand before God and we turn to our redeemer, our kopar, and we say, he paid the price, we paid, he paid the price and he is our advocate. He will do all the talking. And then when he goes to talk to the father, he will say, father, the crimes that have been laid against them if you'll take a close look they've already been paid the judgment has been executed upon them there cannot be double jeopardy they cannot pay for the same crime twice and father will say case dismissed they've are death has already been paid for their sin you may go free and so again redemption in jesus christ through his blood and through his death so if you join me on Facebook, if you're watching this archived, God bless you. We've had a great time. If you want more of this, uh, if you earlier last week or more later as they come on, we're at waysvillelife.com. You can go to the website, go to YouTube, type in my name, Paul Hensley. We're archiving the, the messages there. And uh, if you need prayer or anything like that, go to the website, type in, say, pray for me. Or type it on this. This will come to us and we'll pray for you. Hey, we love you. And uh, God bless. Have a good evening.